Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to the PA Presents tonight. It is the PA Presents from Student to Startup, and we're here working with the um, Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship to bring to you uh, some really cool and exciting things happening here at the university. And to, to sort of explain the ecosystem that's been fostered here um, at Pitt that a lot of people may not know about and not know the depth of what we do here. Um, so what I'm going to do is first, I'd love to introduce to you our esteemed panelists that we were able to get today. Um, so our first is Babs Carrier, the director of the Big Idea Center. Um, Babs is the director of the Big Idea Center from the University of Pittsburgh's Innovation Institute. Her role encompasses programs that encourage and support innovation and entrepreneurship across campus for all students. This goes from freshmen to postdocs and from all disciplines. She teaches the bench top to bedside and the idea to impact technology commercialization courses, as well as some undergrad entrepreneurship courses at Pitt. Babs co-founded LaunchSite, an early venture firm with a portfolio of five companies that have commercialized university technologies. She holds a master's in public management from Carnegie Mellon University and a bachelor's degree from Mills College. She is also a published author of a startup mystery novel, HD 66, Search for a Cure or a Killer, and a short textbook on entrepreneurship, Startup Briefs, The Ultimate No Holds Barred Guide to a Startup. So we'd like to welcome you, Babs, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much, happy to be here. Oh, we're so glad you could join us. Um, so our second panelist that we have here is an alum that came through uh, the ecosystem here at Pitt. This is Brandon Contino. He's uh, alum engineering 2017. He's the co-founder and CEO of Four Growers. Um, what Four Growers is, it's a Y Combinator S18 company that has built harvesting robots for greenhouse farms. If you eat cherry or grape tomatoes, you may have already consumed some of the produce that's been harvested by his company, Four Growers. Prior to Four Growers, Brandon built autonomous drones, developed his own algorithm for optimizing solar panel power production, and built a novel IoT water quality sensor to improve water, mo water monitoring resolution. Brandon is passionate about using technology to help improve the human condition. Thanks for joining us tonight, Brandon. Uh, my pleasure, thanks for having me. Our third panelist is another alum, a two-time alum crossing several disciplines, Doug Nelson. He's engineering and arts and sciences from 09, and then also an engineering grad from 2017. He's the co-founder and CEO of Loomis Corp. This is a University of Pittsburgh licensed startup company that improves healthcare training by making it more efficient and accessible with data analytics, augmented reality, and automated instruction. Doug has more than 10 years experience in the healthcare and simulation research and development, and he is also the co-inventor on three patents. He remains active in mentoring research projects at Pitt as a volunteer faculty member in the School of Nursing. He's won numerous, numerous awards for his service and innovation, including the Carnegie Science Award, Pitt Student Innovator Award, and multiple awards for technology innovation from the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Thanks for joining us tonight, Doug. Thanks, Jason. Looking forward to it. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator right before we get started. Our moderator is Evan Thatcher, the Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at the university and also a Pitt alum. Evan directs Pitt's Office of Innovation and and entrepreneurship. This office strengthens the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship at Pitt and the region by providing a suite of facilitation and support services for innovators. This, this ranges from protecting intellectual property to the commercialization of new discoveries through licensing and or new enterprise development and provides a wealth of educational programming, mentoring and networking for Pitt faculty, students, regional businesses and industry partners to help achieve societal impact through commercialization. Evan has held leadership positions at early stage life science companies, as well as major pharmaceutical companies. As a corporate fundraiser, he brought in nearly 100 million, he brought in nearly $100 million from venture, strategic partner and grant sources and led company and product acquisitions totaling over $600 million in investments. 
Welcome, Vice Chancellor Thatcher. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone this evening and appreciate the panelists for taking the time uh, to talk with us. So what I wanted to do is really just start out by providing a little overview of the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship as it's likely new to, to most of the folks in the audience today. So really at, at, at the end of the day, Pitt's success in empowering in invention and, and really igniting the progress that we've seen in innovation and entrepreneurship is it's enabled by growing this interconnected innovation system that we are putting together on campus. And at, at the center of all of this is the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship which is really the main conduit that we have for pit innovators to engage, connect to program services, funding and, and resources that they need to initiate and assess the commercial potential of their individual innovations, their big ideas and help accelerate those to, to the market. With the help of, of all of our partners on and, and off campus, our offices then assist in incubating and launching innovations into the world. It also serves as the university's gateway for entrepreneurs and companies and other institutions off campus from around the world that want to access Pitt's people, our facilities, and, and the research that we're doing to help drive innovation and economic growth. Now, the question is, why does a university do something like this? And it really is because commercialization is a really key form of impact. The ability to move these ideas that we have on campus, be they from the labs or from the dorm rooms, into new or improved products and services in the market creates that societal impact that all of these innovators are striving for. Also, these innovations are one of the greatest sources of, of regional and, and national economic growth, given that new industries are created by these ideas, given that these organizations create new jobs in the regions that they sit up. And more than ever before, pit innovators are embracing the spirit and striving to make a real impact on the world through commercial translation of their innovations. And all of this is helped by the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is composed of, of, of five uh, business units underneath it. One of them is the Innovation Institute, which oversees the university's intellectual property portfolio and really transfers technologies created in labs to the marketplace. In this organization, we are involved with spinning out 15 to 20 new companies a year, doing transactions with about 130 to 160 other companies a year and getting issued between 85 and 100 new patents annually. We oversee an organization called the Office of Industry and Economic Partnerships, which for the university oversees many of the larger strategic and financial partnerships that we have, the alliance management of those relationships, and also is involved from an economic development perspective in creating the conditions necessary for, for these opportunities to be successful on campus and off campus. We oversee an organization called the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence, which is completely external facing, in that this organization helps regional small businesses throughout all of Southwestern Pennsylvania. These are more Main Street businesses where we help create and launch over 50 new companies a year and then work with about a thousand other more mom and pop Main Street businesses providing their uh, providing entrepreneurial assistance to help them grow and sustain. We oversee an organization called LifeX, which is a regional life sciences accelerator that really is focused on providing early stage companies in the life sciences space specifically with the care and feeding that they need for success. And then lastly, the organization that we're going to spend most of our time with today is called the Big Idea Center. The Big Idea Center is a student-focused innovation and entrepreneurship opportunity. We provide immersive education, acceleration, incubation, run business plan competitions, have entrepreneurs and residents that help students on campus from, from freshman to postdoc, whatever ideas that they have, they can come to the Big Idea Center and we can provide them some form of support to take those ideas and move them out to the marketplace. So with that as a backdrop, the way we're going to run the, uh, the show today is we're going to spend the first 30 or so minutes with a panel discussion. And at, at, the, at that point, we'll then open the floor to questions from the audience. If you have questions, please feel free to put them into, into the, the Q&A function. We will get to those in the last 20 minutes. Uh, and hopefully, we'll have a, a really exciting dialogue. And as always, after the fact, if you want to learn more about what we're doing, feel free to reach out to us. So my first question that I have today is for, for Doug. So Doug, 
you came into the into the overall process, the ecosystem that we've created at the university when we were really just beginning to grow in the areas of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, it's been about seven years since the overall Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship has really been around, and you were one of the first folks to go through many of the programs that we have. So if you could tell us a little bit about how you pivoted from the research that you were doing, because you were a PhD student, and how to u- utilize the tools that were offered by Pitt at that time. Yeah, certainly. Um, thanks for the question, Evan. I think it, it didn't necessarily pivot my research interest so much as pivot my career path. I think the same vision on focusing on technology and, and building new solutions to help out in healthcare simulation was always still the core. But um, my plan for going into a doctoral program was to do be a lifer in academia. And uh, that certainly changed seeing all the entrepreneurial programming and innovation work going on and really at the beginnings of the Innovation Institute. Um, So I took advantage of the gear program in its early stages, went through first gear, second gear, uh, which were programs really, really geared towards um, understanding what uh, customer discovery is, how to find product market fit, how to put together a business plan. Um, coupled with that, at the time, Pitt had some funding from the, the Coulter Foundation, so participated, we're fortunate to be awarded some, some early stage funding to uh, put our ideas down on paper and develop a business plan through the, the Coulter program. Um, and, and that really changed my mind towards, after graduating with my PhD, thinking really seriously about starting a company. Um, and literally the day of graduation in 2017 um, was the day that Loomis was founded. So um, changed really my career trajectory, um, but provided a lot of opportunities and experiences that helped shape how we would move forward with Loomis. Great. Thanks, Doug. We'll get back to you in a little bit. Uh, so my next question is for, for Brandon. You also started using the Pit ecosystem in entrepreneurship and and innovation, just as we were also beginning to grow. Um, What were the programs, the contests, the expertise that that you were utilizing or you learned about on campus that helped you launch the company? Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, So I think first, kind of at a high level, similar to Doug, uh, I didn't necessarily think this is where uh, my career path was going to go. Uh, When I first joined Pitt, I was really interested in neural prosthetics and was thinking I was going to go straight through undergrad to graduate and then also be an academia lifer. Um, But what happened to me is kind of as I got more involved at Pitt, uh, I got really interested in other ways of how we can use technology to improve humanity. And it shifted me more into robotics and also into a water quality and photovoltaic or solar cell realm. And my first experience with one of the Pitt entrepreneurship programs was in Blast Furnace after I had gotten uh, lucky enough to write my own grant to get funding to build a new uh, Internet of Things water quality sensor, I went through the Blast Furnace program, which as Doug mentioned, really focused on, you know, getting out of the building, customer discovery, really finding, you know, what is the true um, kind of product market fit instead of just building something that you think would have value, find someone who has that value and then build something that would solve their needs. And so that was kind of my first intro. I think it was my sophomore or junior year at university when I went through Blast Furnace. Uh, And then from there, for me, the whole water quality morphed into water scarcity, which then got me very interested in how can we actually improve our water demands. And the more I dove into water scarcity, I learned about agriculture and the amount of demand that our agriculture uses on our freshwater resources and got really interested in how can we create a more sustainable way to farm. And that for me bridged into hydroponics and actually the next event, which was the Randall Family Big Idea Center. And so me and my co-founder for Growers had been working in the same lab uh, since my sophomore year. And he had actually started the hydroponics club at university. And so that year we actually applied to the Randall Family Big Idea competition with the concept of building a vertical farm for the Pittsburgh community. And we actually went through the program. We didn't make it to the finals. And as we were going through this process of evaluating, does a vertical farm make sense? Uh, We really couldn't build conviction that vertical farming was the next best sustainable way to farm. Um, But through this, learned about a whole other industry of greenhouse farming, which has all the same benefits of vertical farming, being 90% more water efficient, no herbicides, no pesticides, local production all year round. And we literally just started calling these greenhouses and asking them, what was preventing you from expanding? Uh, Kind of taking the same lessons we learned from Blast Furnace and through Randall, 
Um, and the next year we had a new idea of leveraging our skill sets, my skill set in robotics and software and electrical engineering, and my co-founder skill set in mechanical design to actually build the solution that these greenhouses needed, which was this harvesting automation and analytics platform. And that year when we went through Randall, we were lucky enough to uh, place first and win the Randall competition. And from there, we had an incredible opportunity to then represent Pitt at the ACC competition, as well as the uh, Rice Business Plan competition. Um, and for us, that was kind of our, I don't know if I would say kind of like the first round of funding. I think sometimes you'll hear it called, it's a, the startup kind of student competition round of funding. And then from there, that was really our springboard to move forward. Um, and so I kind of get a little tangenty, but the last piece is then after we graduated, we still had resources from Pitt that we were able to leverage. Um, and so we actually were in the uh, Randall Family Idea Center. And I think we were, were we one of the first companies, we were kind of probably close to the first ones, Fabs, uh, that were able to leverage that space before we kind of had a home uh, to live out of. Right, and I do remember having to sign for a several hundred pound robotic arm in, in our building and then find a way to get it down to where your location was. So I, I remember the day that that happened. So uh, yeah, thank I, you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were at the greenhouse over in Ohio. Uh, and so, yeah, we didn't, we weren't there to receive it. So thank you guys for <laughs> figuring that one out for us. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brandon. We'll come back to you in a couple of seconds. I want to go over to Bab. So, uh, so Babs, you've been, with, uh, with us on the entire journey uh, as over the last six or, or seven years and, re and really focused on, on all the student entrepreneurial programs. Can you t talk us through the growth that you've seen at Pitt uh, to date and then how you, what, you, what you're thinking about planning to continue this growth in entrepreneurship and innovation on, on campus? You're on mute. Um, absolutely. Thanks, Evan. Uh, yeah, happy to um, talk a little bit about our fabulous Big Idea Center and the, and the origins and, and kind of where we're heading. So um, when I started at Pitt, uh, which is around the same time that Evan did, um, it was seven years ago, and it was at the very beginning of the Innovation Institute. And, and Pitt was really kind of putting the stake in the ground around innovation and entrepreneurship. They were kind of saying, you know what, we're late to the party, uh, we're a sleeping giant, but uh, we can be really, uh, we can do this. And um, as I sort of joined the Innovation Institute, I one of the first things I did was sort of do a scan of what we had and, and what I thought that we lacked. And I had come here from Carnegie Mellon University where I'd spent quite a few years with my colleagues at Project Olympus and, and the early days of the Swartz Center, trying to build that uh, ecosystem and as I looked around Pitt, I realized there just wasn't uh, anything for students. There certainly was nothing that was cross campus. Um, and so that was the first thing that, that we really decided to do was let's build student programs. So where there was nothing, then we built one and then we started another one. And we got a lot of interest from students. And uh, you've heard a couple of times tonight this from freshman to postdoc, we sort of canned that phrase and across the whole university, like doesn't just have to be business students, doesn't just have to be computer science or engineers, but anybody. And so we built um, piece by piece a, a series of programs uh, that has really generated a lot of interest and has really been wildly successful uh, with, uh, you know, projects like what you're hearing from tonight in terms of four growers and uh, Loomis and, and, and all kinds of other ones. And so three years ago, uh, one of our donors to the Randall Family Big Idea Competition, which Brandon and his uh, co-founder Dan won a few years ago for $25,000, which was like the equivalent of a tiny little seed round of, of student competitions. Um, that the donor for that, Bob Randall, um, was willing to give some money to the university to form the Big Idea Center. And uh, we, we, we called it the Big Idea Center because when we would have breakfast together and talk about this, we were like, this is a big idea. We can really do this. So all the programs then that we had built uh, came under the center and became uh, this Big Idea Center, which is really for students um, so that they have a place and they have a series of programs that speaks to them um, across all these disciplines and they can interact with each other and, and participate in these programs and learn from each other as well as from us uh, at the Big Idea Center. So that was three years ago. Uh, now we're kind of going strong and uh, we're getting our own space. 
uh, soon on Forbes, kind of in the heart of the retail uh, center there uh, for specifically students to come and, and work out their, their ideas and meet with us uh, and our EIRs, our entrepreneurs and residents. Um, and we uh, very recently have launched a brand new program called the Big Idea Advantage Fund. Uh, so I have Evan to thank for helping to wrestle a few donors um, in to uh, form a fund, uh, the first ever at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, that's going to invest in actual startups, in, in actual companies um, that are student run um, and, 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 and kind of go from there. So we've got a small amount of money that we're doing. This is our first round of this fund this spring. Um, so, you know, really where we started with the competition, we now have a student accelerator called Blast Furnace that you heard about from Brandon. We have a student incubator. Once you go through Randall and you get into Blast Furnace and you do your customer discovery and you still think there's something here, but you're not quite ready to be launched into the big bad wild world, uh, we incubate you uh, for the entire academic year or beyond. Uh, that program is called The Forge. We have a little tiny bit of seed grant money for that. Um, and so we work really hard to uh, make sure that you optimize for success when you spin out of the university. And, and I know most of you probably on this um, webinar are alums and probably you didn't have access to most of these programs when, when you were there. And I will say that we are happy to involve you now, um, happy to help you, of course, but also happy to leverage your own expertise and bring you on as mentors. We've got lots of opportunities to judge. Uh, and meet with student teams and, and help them. So turning right. it back over to you, Evan. Great, so I just wanted to follow up on that. So can you talk about how many students typically come through the Big Idea Center annually and then from, what, from where on campus are they coming from? Yeah, so for a series of years, we kind of doubled every year from, you know, when we first just had one competition and we had a couple hundred students and then soon we were four and 500 and now we're a, we're a couple of thousand of students uh, annually. Of course, COVID has had a little bit of an impact on that. Um, I think things are, are at the same or maybe a little bit less uh, simply because uh, students are, are Zoom exhausted and uh, it's really hard to market to them right now. But that said, what we've seen over the years is a definite increase in student demand. Um, and when they find out about us, I got an email today from a high school student that found out about the Big Idea Center and they're all excited to you know, come and start and he's like, can I enroll early and therefore use your services and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that, um, you know, students at Pitt are, are getting the message and they're realizing that while most of the programs that we do are outside of the classroom, you know, they're not part of an academic curriculum. Yes, there are some entrepreneurship classes and, and I teach actually some of them, but really these programs are extracurricular. You do them outside of your major, outside of your academic program. But students have realized the incredible value that they get from these programs so that no matter what they decide to do in the future, yes, they may become startup entrepreneurs like Brandon and Doug here, but they may not. They may go off and, and get a job, um, but they may be involved in innovation within an existing company. And the skill set that students have picked up, you know, leadership, ability to work in a team, ability to present, understanding markets and competition and how to, how to understand, you know, financial spreadsheets and, and statements is incredibly valuable. So we've seen that students, um, they, they, they love what we do um, and, they're, and they're coming to us. And we're really hoping that when we get back on campus, hopefully in the fall, that we will find that, that students, um, you know, kind of flock to what we do because they stand to benefit, we stand to benefit, and quite frankly, so does the region and beyond uh, as startups are created like Loomis and for growers that are hiring people and hiring pit alums and providing a lot of value uh, to our communities. All right, thanks. So, uh, I'm gonna turn back over to, to Brandon and Doug. I, I actually have the same question for you both. So whoever I pick first is gonna be more on the spot than the other, but. In the stories that you both told, neither of you came to Pitt with a focus on, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to start my own business, I want to start my own company. Can you recall, was there a specific moment, a program, a person or event where the light went off and you said, hey, this is something that I think I may want to do. There may be an opportunity here for me to create my own job, my own company, my own, my own uh, path forward. So I'll, 
let me, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Doug first uh, uh, and see if he has, a, you have any thoughts and then Brandon, I'll, I'm going to ask you the same question. Yeah, I think it was, for me, it was just the, the, the buildup of many different things, right? I'd say one of the early things was presenting our work at conferences, um, having this really wonky prototype that we were showing off and people saying, how much is it? Can I buy, can I buy it? And we're like, I, I don't like, it's a research prototype. What do you mean you want to buy it? So that was like an early signal for us, not necessarily related to university programming or, or mentorship for, for really wanting to go out and start a company. But that was really the early inkling of, hey, maybe we have something here. So we started into uh, exploring some of the programming that was just up and coming at Pitt. And uh, another one I would say is, is to bookend things. That was kind of early on in my academic research career. But then on, on the flip side, on, on the other end of it, just before leaving Pitt, um, the chancellor had started uh, an innovation fund for um, providing some funding for student-led projects um, to, to really boost them and, and launch them outside of the university. Um, so the Chancellor's Innovation Fund, we were one of the first recipients of that and, and having that validation from the Chancellor saying, you know, we're, we're all in with uh, student innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, we like what you're doing. We're gonna support this. We were able to get matching funds from another um, early investor idea foundry which uh, helps economic development in the region. And with those two together, that really, really sealed the deal and said, yeah, we're going to do this full time. Um, uh, and really launched it. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to give Brandon a couple more seconds to, to think because I, the, you mentioned that, that Chancellor Commercialization Gap Fund. Just the, the, the background story is that uh, we, we received about a million dollars from the Chancellor's office to spend a, over two years, provide projects that we thought had commercial potential, this additional money to move those opportunities closer to the marketplace, given that traditional grant dollars don't do that. Um, it took us about two years to get through that million dollars. And at the end of the day, we put money into about 50 projects. The interesting thing has been the results of that first go around. And those 50 projects, we ended up with about 35% of those projects spinning out to, to new companies. So it was a pretty high rate. The, I think the most important thing is those companies that spun out have since raised through grants and traditional funding over $20 million themselves. So this $1 million kind of investment in our, in our faculty, staff, and students has now brought in kind of over $20 million to, to those companies. And as importantly is those companies, especially ones that had taking licenses from the university, have now cumulatively paid back to the university more than that million dollars that we originally put in. So you, you kind of see this interesting benefit of funding going to help this commercialization gap funding that then seeds uh, economic development in the region. Um, but yes, uh, Doug's team was one of the first that did that. And they are certainly one of our poster children for success. And we just received our, our next tranche of our next million dollars given the success that we've had the first go around. So Brandon, I think I've given you enough time to hopefully come up with a long-winded answer related to Kind of what was there a person, a program, or event? Was there something, a light bulb that went off in your mind that said, "Hey, this is something that may be pretty cool. I can, I can focus on." Yeah, um, I think for me, kind of similar to Doug, there wasn't a single light bulb that went off. But I, I think one of the biggest things that the Innovation Institute did for me was it opened my eyes to the possibility. Um, I think really coming into university, I hadn't thought about the concept of starting a company and what that would mean. And I think really the programs to the Innovation Institute open the eyes to, you know, what does that mean? It provides a little bit of tactical knowledge on how do you actually go through and do it. Um, but I think for me personally, what was really the transformative experience was the experiences that I got through Pitt as a whole. Um, part of that was being able to have, you know, really great internships uh, with large corporations who have great names, great pay, and realizing that that atmosphere was interesting and it was nice, but it wasn't something that was fully engaging. Um, and for me, what I kind of like in my first kind of aha moment, I guess closest thing to would actually be through the Pit Robotics and Automation Society. 
in my freshman year when I joined that group, uh, we were just a small group of five people. And, you know, we liked robots and we wanted to build robots. And I was lucky enough to be a part of kind of the leadership team and become president and grow the organization from the five people when I first joined to over 60 people uh, by the time that I left. And so it was really my first experience of first we had to find, you know, what is it that we're actually going to do? Kind of what is our product? that we're building. Uh, you had to go recruit the team, you had to find the funding from the university uh, and other outside sponsorships, and then you had to actually go through and execute. And I really enjoyed that experience. And I think that along with what the Innovation Institute opened my eyes up to really kind of created this idea of, oh, this is a path that I could like to walk. And then for me, it was then really finding a problem that I wanted to dedicate my life to, uh, towards solving. And that's really where the agriculture and the hydroponics uh, really came in for me. All right, thanks. Um, before we get to the next question, I'd like to encourage folks that are on the line here, please send in your, your questions. We, we're going to get to them in about 10 or so minutes, uh, and we'll, so we'll get through as many of those as we can as well. Babs, um, this, is a, this is an alumni-focused event. I'm, I'm sure the alums in the audience would like to know who, what schools on campus are the ones that are kind of most contributing students to, uh, to the programs that, that we have. Are there are there some that are really involved? Is it similar across all the all the schools on campus? Or give us a little bit of story on that. No, that's a that's a great question, Evan. Um, I wish it was um, a little bit more even. I will say that um, we get a lot from engineering. Um, I think engineers are problem solvers by by nature, and so they 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 seek us out. They find us. We tend to have more students from engineering. Uh, than any other school. Um, but of course, we've got uh, students from business. Uh, we've got students from, you know, our new school of computing and information. I, I call it new, but it's, it's a few years old now. But, you know, they took computer science out of arts and sciences. And that's been a really big, because um, we didn't really have any uh, when I first started. And now we have a lot of students from that. We have a lot of students from the School of Medicine. Uh, in particular, in the last, I would say, three or four years, um, we really have a tremendous amount uh, from School of Medicine. And of course, we have some from Arts and Sciences. Um, you know, and Arts and Sciences is, is, is giant. Um, and they come, you know, from everywhere in Arts and Sciences. We get them, believe it or not, from theater. We get them from neuroscience. We get them from, um, you know, the hard sciences, you know, chemistry, biology, and, and stuff like that. So uh, it's really from, uh, you know, a little bit of all over. And I think that um, one, of the, the, one of the reasons that uh, the students really love coming to the Big Idea Center and participating in programs, it's one of the very few places on campus where you can interact with other students, not just other students in your program, but students in your whole school and students outside of your school and in other schools and students, you know, freshmen can interact with graduate students. And in addition, we partner a tremendous amount with Carnegie Mellon. So a lot of the programs that we do are in conjunction with CMU and that means that CMU students are interacting with Pitt students and vice versa. And sometimes they're pitted against each other, but a lot of times they're on the same teams, right? We've got Pitt and CMU, and they really love that. We get accolades uh, about that from both Pitt and Carnegie Mellon students, that they really love that. And I think we're going to see an increase of that kind of interest and that kind of collaboration in the future for students. All right. Thanks. Brandon, question for you. So you are... You were involved with a lot of pitch competitions on campus. You won the Randall Family Big Idea Competition, but kind of in the real world, you've pitched at Y Combinator, you've pitched to investors. Can you give the audience a, a little bit of a flavor for what's the difference of a pitch in a competition inside of a university setting and kind of a pitch in the real world setting where you're asking people to put their dollars on the line? Yeah, I think probably the first thing that comes to mind in kind of competition versus real dollar, of course, is the stakes. Um, it's a little bit higher stakes with the, the larger checks. Um, but really, at a whole, I think a lot of it is pretty similar in terms of the, the structure, the content. Um, what I found kind of as we go through pitching is sometimes you might have a little bit more diligence or Q&A uh, when you're pitching a, a full investor, because generally you might be pitching an investor who knows your space. And so they'll have a little bit more specific or targeted questions. Um, but I do think kind of pitch competitions do a, a pretty good job preparing you for what it is like to actually pitch. Um, I will say every uh, investor has kind of their own style. So why Combinator specifically is very, very different from what like a Randall pitch competition is. You basically have, I believe it was 10 minutes 
uh, to, I say it's like a 10 minute interview for 30 minutes worth of information. Uh, and it's a, I really enjoyed it, it was a fun experience, um, but it really just comes down to if you know your business and you've done your homework, uh, regardless, I think of the format or how you pitch, uh, that's really the key. All right. And then sort of similar, Doug, but I'm going to focus on customers. So you mentioned that one of the things that kind of became interesting to you as you were in the research world and, and, and people were asking you these questions around, can I buy, can I buy this widget? Talk about your, your first interactions with a real customer. What was that like? Was, were you ready for that? Were you trained for it? Did you learn anything on campus? Was it completely eye-opening? Talk a little bit about uh, that, uh, that from an entrepreneurial perspective, that customer interaction. I think part of it is the difference in definitions around customer, right? And the customer is many things. Um, the customer for us is, is oftentimes the educators and the faculty who are teaching new healthcare providers, but that's just one aspect of it. The part that what I think was eye-opening is all of the contracting and necessary agreements to jump through and hoops to jump through just to get the deal done. And so realizing that there are these, these uh, administrative barriers to entry in many instances when dealing with larger corporate or institutional customers um, was something that I wasn't fully uh, aware of through the programming. But I think part of the programming helped me to understand once jumping through those hurdles, how to in interact with the customers in terms of figuring out what functions and features would be necessary to push forward on and what might not might not be very necessary in the, in the end. Um, one of the things we realized was uh, there's a lot of IT hurdles in this space and, and reliance on tech trained folks. So um, these are people who have a, a healthcare background who are primarily the customers and educators using our solution. So if we could lower the technical knowledge necessary in order to use the platform, we really saw value in that. So I would say having that experience of interacting with customers and identifying um, who the different stakeholders are in the, the chain of business, you know, that certainly has been helpful. All right, thank you. Bab, so you're a, a, a naturally energetic uh, personality and, and uh, bubbly, but when, when you think about the work that you're doing on campus, what are the things that kind of are inspiring you or keep you engaged and excited uh, even despite kind of the situations that we're dealing with now from a pandemic perspective. What, what, what is, what's inspiring you about the work that you're doing? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I came to Pitt, Evan, I really did make a conscious decision. Um, I went to my boss at the time, who was your predecessor, Mark Melandro, and I said, I don't care what my title is, but this is what I want to do. I want to work with students. Um, and the reason that I felt that is I had actually worked a lot with um, non-students, with faculty and stuff like that at Carnegie Mellon and other places. And, and that, was, that was great and that was um, rewarding and I'm not going to bash faculty. But you know what? I think students are the leaders of tomorrow. They're going to run this world. And I feel like in my sort of to my last breath, the one thing that I really have to give and that I'm good at is to give um, students the um, skills that they need to be able to do this, you know, to, to, to help people like Brandon um, become wildly successful um, and create the impact uh, that, that we know that he can create. And so what has sort of motivated me for the, for the seven years I've, I've been here and, and to build the Big Idea Center and, and to kind of, you know, build these programs, um, you know, it's been because they're they're for students and students are at a university to learn. So they're open, they're willing, um, they've, 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 you know, and you have a chance to, you know, to, to change lives um, and, and to create an impact that would be very, very difficult um, in any other setting. And I have um, enjoyed that tremendously and feel that that's really um, a, a, a job that, that universities should do because we need innovation to solve the world's problems, right? We got a lot of problems to solve. And the only way that they're gonna get solved is through innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, everything that we use on a daily basis was once a startup. So students are the um, heart and soul of that. And I think we need to put our attention uh, to training students and encouraging them. I, I'm not sure that you can really teach entrepreneurship, and I say that as a professor of entrepreneurship, but I am sure that you can unleash the entrepreneur within and that if you allow them um, to, to do it themselves and give them some guidance that they will 
come up with incredible ideas to solve incredibly big problems. And that's what we are. We're like the trail guides. Great. Thanks, Bob. So we're going to we're going to shift into the part of the program. We're going to do some of the Q&A that's up on the board. So uh, panelists, take a look, but be ready because I'm just going to fire from what I see and probably just go down the line. So um, so Brandon, looking back, if you could change one thing about the journey that you took, what would you change and, and why? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know if I can answer that very in depth on the spot. Uh, I think I definitely had a very windy path, um, but I think that's part of what led me uh, to where I am today. Uh, this is a very tactical answer, but one thing that I wish I'd learned sooner was the concept of letters of intent. And I think if I had known that while I was in university, that the concept that you can actually have someone sign a non-binding agreement that details out exactly what you need to build and how much they'll pay and how much, I think knowing that sooner would have been nice. It would have been easier to fundraise later down the line if we had those letters of intent signed earlier. Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry. whoever asked that. It's probably not the answer you're looking for. I'm sorry. We're gonna, Doug is going to add some support as well. So now that he looks excited to answer that question. It's, uh, so Doug, if, if there is something that you would change about the about the journey, what would it be if there's anything? Yeah, I think I've tried to be very uh, efficient with our funds. And I think to some extent that uh, has could have been done better in a way. Uh, I'm learning that you need to spend more money quicker to move faster. And I think that's part of what I would say in answer to this is don't be so frugal and just like go after it. <laughs> That's one of the things that I would change. Right. And then, so the next question is also for both, both uh, Brandon and Doug. Um, I'm going to go with Brandon first. So Doug has a couple of seconds to think I owe him that. So what, what's the, been the proudest moment or achievement so far in your, in your journey? Yeah, I think for this one, uh, I don't know if it's really been static. I feel like it's always changing. You know, there's one more problem to solve and there's one more terrible thing that happens. Uh, and I think kind of each problem along the way uh, just keeps getting more exciting. Um, I think it was definitely an incredible experience to go through Y Combinator. It was incredible to win Randall. I think we've been very lucky as a company uh, with the opportunities that we've been given. Um, but I think ultimately really the, the proudest piece is probably just seeing our product in the greenhouse picking and knowing that those tomatoes that we have picked have gone to grocery store shelves that consumers have now eaten and really being able to first see the real transition of our food system into this more sustainable way of growing. All right. Thanks, Doug. What are you, what are you even proud of? Yeah. So I would say, uh, again, I agree that there's not one specific thing. It just keeps building and it's this roller coaster of peaks and valleys. Um, but you know, Funding certainly has uh, plays a big role in this, but uh, to get awarded uh, phase one SBIR grant from the NIH is certainly up there. Um, waking up and almost having a heart attack, seeing that email in the inbox at 7 a.m. Um, saying that we're going to get that funding and, and be able to build some solutions to towards um, improving the opioid epidemic. Uh, that that was certainly one thing that's that's really up there. Um, you know, that and similarly seeing um, our tools out there in practice improving training, seeing the early results from some of our pilot studies at, at seeing big gains in student learning with respect to using our solutions um, is also up there. Okay. Uh, Babs, a question for you actually uh, that came to mind is not necessarily on the list, but uh, a, a similar kind of thing though is what, what are you most proud of? What are the things that you've seen accomplished over your seven years here that, that you uh, are, are most excited about? Or are there a couple of things that, that, that kind of, again, emphasize why, why you do what you do? I, I think for me, um, like I said, it's about students. So you know that's gonna be in the answer. I think, um, but it's also, it's about the ongoing relationship 
um, that we've kept with our, we call them now the big idea family. I know that's a little bit soppy, but in all honesty, Brandon knows I contact him all the time and I'm always asking him to judge or mentor or, or whatever, you know, and he's always great. He gets back to me and says, yeah, you know, no problem. Like he's like our, our first uh, chat interchange. As soon as I logged on tonight, he was like, how long do you need that video for? <laughs> right. Cause I, I asked him because to make a video for our award celebration. So I, I think that for me, I, I'm a relationship person, and I think it's really important at the university that we, um, you know, respect our students and help them create companies if that's what they want to do and, you know, push them along. I mean, we're sort of the Big Idea Center is a little bit the tough love. Like, if you, if you, if you want to be complimented, you don't come to the Big Idea Center. We're going to push you, right? But then when you do well, we're going to stay in touch with you and really, um, you know, help you in any way that we can. And, and I think it's really important for the burgeoning entrepreneurs. We had a conversation this morning internally with the blast furnace coming up next month. And we were like, let's bring back some past blast furnace attendees to talk to the current attendees that will be there in a month to say how valuable that that experience was. Because we can tell them that, but when someone that just went through it last year or the year before says it, it, it means so much more. And so I think the, the thing that we've done well and the thing that I think is really important to do is to spin out these companies, but then maintain long-term um, informal advisory relationships with them so that I can, you know, call Doug and say, hey, you know, would you judge the Randall Family Big Idea competition, you know, knowing that that they're happy to sort of give back to their alma mater and stay in touch and work with students. And, you know, just imagine five and 10 years down the road, that's going to be just a cadre of uh, entrepreneurs that are uh, involved and still involved with the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm, I'm proud of that and, and hope that that continues for a long time to come. Yeah, I think to build on that a bit too, sorry to jump in here, but that's one of the things that, you know, being in the early stages and maybe Brandon can talk about this too, is that I would have looked for and appreciate that the, the growth is happening in this area is mentorship for early stage companies and even later stage companies um, having those interactions with folks and leveraging the alumni network in order to do that. And maybe if there's some resources available to, to connect that kind of like social media, although through the pit channels, uh, that's certainly something that uh, I think would have been helpful moving forward and, and still could be helpful moving forward now that we've spun out. So the, go ahead, Brandon, you want to? Well, I was just going to tack on and say, yeah, I know it was definitely great when you guys started bringing EIRs and we don't have EIRs for mentorship. I also remember it was funny, my uh, TA my freshman year ended up, uh, Noah Snyder uh, ended up winning Randall. And so he was right. a reference for me as we were growing too, which was really nice to have. Uh, Noah and I played high school football together, <laughs> interestingly enough. Really, same team or would you guys battle opposite? Uh, he was the center and I was the quarterback. So we <laughs> oh, knew each nice. other well. You're very, yeah. <laughs> And I just got a text message from him just a couple of days ago saying that COVID was a really tough year, um, but they, they've turned the corner and he's doing really well. Right. So, you know, we stay in touch. So the, the next question I'll answer. So the question is, how many companies does the university have an ownership interest in? So the way that typically works, so for, for student companies, there's no ownership interest unless the company was based off of intellectual property created in, in a lab using university funds or, or, or grant funds. So, so in the situation we have here, we actually have one of each. So Doug's company would, came out of uh, research done in, in the lab while he was doing his, his graduate work based on, on federal funding and other funding. So that intellectual property, the university owned, and then we licensed it to him. And as part of that license, the university receives equity in the company. Uh, Brandon's company was purely kind of from the dorm room. Uh, the university provides these services for free. Uh, don't ask for anything in return other than when uh, four growers becomes bigger than Whole Foods. We're hopeful that he is uh, beneficent with his, uh, with his wealth and gives back to the university, but, but we don't own equity there. So the, the number of companies that we spin out every year that's, that are based on university intellectual property is anywhere between 15 to 20, we've probably spun out about 100 over the last six years. And a good number of those we have equity in. Uh, to the extent they're still around, there is still equity. Uh, 
there is, you know, a, a rate of failure over over kind of a five year period of time. So we have we have equity probably now in about 35 or 40 of these startup companies. And then the only difference is what Babs mentioned earlier is for these student only startup companies, we we are we just started our first uh, call it a venture fund from from donations from from uh, from uh, alums as well. So there we also will do some form of direct investment and we'll probably be doing three to four a year, or sorry, three or four a semester for the next uh, for the next couple of years. But those are for student startups and we're going to start to have some equity ownership uh, in there. Yeah, because uh, of the moms. If I can jump in, Evan, it, you know, on the student side, um, you know, alone, the, the companies like 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 at the Big Idea Center, we work with both Pitt IP like Doug's and, and non like Brandon's. Um, but, but on the student side, we spin out between probably 10 and 15 uh, student startups annually uh, as well. So it's, a, it's, it's really a burgeoning uh, movement at Pitt. So related to that, I'm gonna pull out this next question here is asking what more is needed funding wise to help student startups survive and thrive in the Pittsburgh region? Uh, so let me start there. It's a two-part question related to, can we ever be close to Boston or, or Silicon Valley um, or do we need a new formula? So maybe Babs, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll reach it out to you. What, what more needed is, what more is needed funding wise to help these students start up, survive and, and grow in the region? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, everybody always says, you know, there's just not enough money. Um, yeah, in, in a way that's true. Um, I'm not, really one that harps on that. I think that uh, money is fungible. And if you really have a really great idea, like four growers, you'll find money, right? It may not be all in Pittsburgh, but you know, you can bring money anywhere as well. So um, I think, yes, of course, we, we continue to need funds um, in Pittsburgh. We really don't have a lot of institutional money. So once you get past the seed stage, you really have to go outside Pittsburgh. So I think you can, you know, Brandon can, can tell you where his investors are located. I would imagine there's very few, if any, really in Pittsburgh. Um, I think what we really need in Pittsburgh, um, yeah, we're never going to be Boston or Silicon Valley. We, we really can't be. We're a tiny city. Uh, you know, the city of Pittsburgh itself is just a few hundred thousand, two hundred, you know, it's two million uh, in the greater metropolitan region and we're isolated, right? So Boston has Boston and Cambridge and, you know, a lot of other cities nearby, we don't, right? Our closest city is Cleveland. So I, I think that what we really need is talent. Um, we need people to, to stay here and build their companies here, hire uh, the alums from the universities and build their companies, home grow their companies. And then from there, as they become successful, then that money gets, gets recycled. So I think we're kind of in the process of doing that. I think that, um, you know, our, our population in, in Pittsburgh is, um, it's somewhat stable and, and still declining a little bit. So it's not like it's growing. You know, people Brandon's and Doug's ages, um, uh, you know, statistically are not staying. And I think if they do, that's how you get the interest of money. Money will come where there's deals. Well, the, and the, so other thing, the other thing <laughs> I'll add is, from an operational perspective, all of these programs that we just talked about are soft funded. There is no university line item that funds all this effort. So everything that we do funding wise is from support from the foundations, it's from philanthropy, it's from some grants that we can get. So what more needed funding wise is all the resources that we've just talked about that have been providing uh, for Brandon's success and for Doug's success is, is really you know us looking for money in the couch cushions to be successful. So uh, from a purely philanthropic perspective to keep these things going and to grow them, it's gonna, it's gonna require resources uh, beyond even what we have now to, to get to the level that we want to. Um, all right, so I think we maybe have time for one more question, Jason, is that, uh, does that make sense given where we are time-wise? Actually, it looks from the two of them are pretty interesting for both okay. people. So if we could go ahead and do these two questions we've got here, we'll be good. Got it. All right. So uh, uh, the first question is, we all know we learn by failures and mistakes. So what's the fail rate for these incubator companies? So since Brandon and Doug have both been successful and they haven't failed, I'm going to ask Babs, for, for your, from your experience, from the ones that we have spun out, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the the fail rate for for companies that have come out from the university setting? Yeah, I'm, I, surprisingly enough, um, you know, we've been tracking this for about five years, so it doesn't go back, you know, dozens of years. 
Um, we, most of the companies that were formed and spun out, um, in all honesty, most of them, the, by, by far the vast majority are still around. Now, some of them are kind of small businesses. Um, every single winner of the top prize at Randall, um, you know, in the, in the last what, seven years or so, um, like Brandon, is doing a startup. So I think, you know, the thing that if you if you give students the education that they where they can make decisions, they're not going to willy nilly go off and do a startup that's going to immediately fail. They know exactly what it's going to take and they do it carefully and they do it right. And we've optimized for success uh, because they're they, they at least have a, 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 an idea of what's ahead. Okay. So it's surprisingly I gonna, high. I was going to I was going to add on the. On the university technology side, it's similar. The five-year survival rate is probably about 80%. Um, all right, last question for the entrepreneurs, and I'll let whoever raises their hand uh, first can get it, uh, and then we'll ask the other, or I'll just randomly pick if neither of you raise your hand. So for the entrepreneurs, you, are you focused solely in the U.S., or do you have plans to go uh, outside the U.S., or is it just too soon to even be thinking about the outside U.S. markets? I can go ahead and start with this one. Um, I think it depends maybe what you consider international. If you consider Canada, uh, truly international as technically it is, uh, then we already have customers that are outside the US. Um, and then we also have uh, letters of intent and other agreements with people on the other side of the Atlantic as well. So we very much are uh, kind of an international company. Perfect. Doug. Yeah, we actually had, um, before we even had products to sell, we had strong interest from the other pond um, over the Pacific, and we were exploring some of those avenues since really focused domestically, but see really large opportunities internationally as well for education. A lot of folks in the healthcare space really look to the U.S. in, in many ways for adopting best practices in, believe it or not, healthcare uh, and training in healthcare. Um, and so we see a lot of interest in that. We aren't there yet internationally, but we did get a lot of early markers in that space. So the last thing for the for both Doug and Brandon, since you're always looking for funding and partners, I want to give you each the chance to tell people where they can contact you to learn more about your companies, because this is not only this audience, but this is being taped and it's going to go to hundreds and hundreds of others. And we would love for people to reach out to you that are either here today or or we'll see it later. So, so Doug, if someone wants to reach out to you to learn more, where can they do that? Yeah, Doug.Nelson at LumisCorp.com, L-U-M-I-S-C-O-R-P.com, uh, as well as our website has contact information on there or connect with me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Brandon? Uh, yes, yeah, similar to Doug. Uh, true Startup Fashion, the email is just my first name, Brandon at fourgrowers.co. Uh, we unfortunately do not have that M, so it's just dot .co. Uh, right. And then likewise, there's also a form on the website, a very, very bland, uh, semi-stealth website. Perfect. That you can All right, check. Jason, turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Evan. Um, th this is actually, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I hope what we did here was really got to shed a light on all these fantastic things that are happening at Pitt within innovation and entrepreneurship. Got to look at Brandon and Doug and both of these companies uh, getting to hear your story and the resources that came about at Pitt. And since both of you went through when it was such an early stage in where Pitt was in building this ecosystem and seeing how you're both, you know, running the companies that you have and being successful, but still working back with the students who are going through the same programs that you went through and having those same types of questions. Like Brandon, I love your, your one about the letter of intent, you know, like it's things you would never, ever think of. Um, that you hear of when people want to start a company or think they can start a company that they just aren't prepared for on the certain sides. So it was great to hear that. I want to thank Brandon, Babs, Evan, and Doug for your time tonight. Um, it's been great. Like we said here, this will be um, recorded. Everybody who signed up will get the recording sent to them. It'll also be archived on the Pitt alumni website and we'll be sending it out through some other newsletters. So for, I just want to, again, thank all of you for joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, I, I hope this continues. And anyone who needs more contact information, please contact me and I'll get you set up with the right person. Thank you all very much.